No. I, I've got to put this to you because we're nearing the end of time, but I know that you get uh, letters, emails, and other people who... I mean, you're talking now and you're talking in such a wonderful, uh, enthusiastic, appreciative way uh, about about animals, about nature, about the world out there. And I, you know that this leads some people to say, why can't you just say this is all so wonderful and so beautiful, therefore there must have been a designer, therefore there must be a god? Because you do exhibit or, you know, this, the type of emotion perhaps someone might display entering a very grand Florentine cathedral, for example. But it isn't, it, that, it, it's not a religious awe that you are showing, is it? I mean, how, how do you... Isn't it? Well, well, is it religious? Do you want to use the word religious about it? No, I, I, I shrink from the word, but, but I wouldn't say that that meant necessarily that you, you that demonstrates that the God didn't exist, on the contrary. But the intelligent, because the, the, what, they, what you're being nudged towards is an intelligent... That's dis- a different thing. Yes. Um, well, uh, the, um, I have no quarrel with basic fundamental religious uh, attitudes. Uh, if I have a quarrel, if I have a quarrel, well, I do have a quarrel, about the literal interpretation of texts, fundamentalism... Uh, I have a quarrel about people who think that the the book of Genesis is uh, literally true. Uh, And my argument to dealing with that is, uh, if you... uh, 150 years ago, people living in Britain might think that was the only account of creation. But we now know that societies all around the world each have their own account. Each has felt the necessity to explain why it is that they, human beings, are here. Now, all these accounts differ. If you go to Thailand, it's, they believe there was the, the, in the first beginning of creation there was a sea of milk, there was a huge snake in it, and there were demons pulling it and churning it, and, and when the curds came out, they told the human being. If you go to the aboriginals, uh, they believe that the, the human beings were coughed up by a giant snake which became a rainbow in the sky. You can produce hundreds of them. How are you to choose them? How would you, which is correct. If you say, I'm only going to believe the one that my mother told me when I was brought up at my mother's knee and I'm not going to question anything else, well, then that's up to you. But if you take a more, a more uh, general view and say, OK, you can't all be right, there is actually an answer which you can look in the rocks and the, and the animals themselves... And the interesting thing about that uh, is that it's all the same. No matter where you come from, whether you're an Australian or Aboriginal or European or whatever, then that's the one I go for. But you don't want to go the full hog because, I mean, somebody like your old friend Richard Dawkins used to go tadpoling with him years ago. I think Richard Dawkins would say, look, let's... You would, I think you described yourself as an agnostic, but he'd want to say, look, why don't you say that you're an atheist? Because if you say that... You clear away all this religious clutter and people can then appreciate the scientific wonder of the world. But your agnosticism, I think, is a... Is this, would you say it's a scientific agnosticism? You feel as a scientist you yes, should I never think, say you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't help thinking uh, of when I have, for example, taken off the, the top of a termite hill and I've seen termites in there... Um, all busying about um, building walls, looking after the queen, caring for the pupae, clearing the nest, um, all busy about it. Then they're all blind, and they have the faintest idea that I am there watching what they're doing because they don't have those sense organisms which would allow them to know that. And I do sometimes feel that maybe I'm lacking in some sense organ, and I don't know whether there's anybody else involved in all this sort of thing. And it's a, it's a very um, confident thing to say that you're absolutely sure uh, that, uh, that there's nothing in this world that I don't have the sense organs to appreciate. That's, that would be my position. And Richard, I don't, I don't doubt, would say, well, that's rather feeble. That's not being very brave. And he maybe has got a case. Very last thing. Uh, you always say when people talk about all the work that you've done, an extraordinary degree of work. I mean, compared to so many academic, biologists, zoologists, what you have shown, what you have displayed, what you've demonstrated is enormous. 
you occasionally say when people present this to you, oh, no, I'm not a scientist, oh, no, I've discovered nothing, I rely upon experts, they set it all out for me. Really, I'm, I'm just a journalist. Isn't that... Aren't you being just a little too modest? No, I don't think so. I would like to say, I mean, uh, scientists... Um, uh, scientists are occupied in just pulling, a pu just pulling to one side that, that curtain and just revealing just a tiny little more of the truth that nobody has seen before. And I sometimes say to my friends who I was at university with, oh, no, you must feel that uh, when you have actually suddenly perceived something you've never perceived before. And they said, oh, well, maybe. But on the other hand, we haven't had the fortune to go underwater swimming on the Barrier Reef. And, you know, and so it's, you know, it's winners and losers. Uh, but I, I would like to think I'm a sufficient of a scientist to make sure that what I say is scientifically correct. But I can't claim that I am a scientist in the, in the way that many of my friends are, Desmond, for example, uh, who have actually had perceptions uh, which nobody else had had before.